this evening we're going to be talking about myth as reality, which may be a strange topic for some folks. Um, virtually all religious traditions, cultures, and societies breathe, embrace myths at many different levels. And myths are attributed to societies many millennia ago. There are myths that are decades old. So it's something that has happened, you know, 4,000 years ago and something that's happened 10 years ago or sooner. In other words, there must be a role and a place and a need for myth that is as relevant today as it was a thousand years ago or a decade ago. And throughout my academic and religious life, I've encountered a wide variety of responses to myth. And I chose to do this presentation partly out of my own curiosity to, since I'd never actually done a paper on myth or anything like that, and I thought to myself, you know, let's, let me, by doing that, I, I, I further explore it in my own mind and my own curiosity, but also because people often have a negative response to myths. And I, and, I, and I really mean negative. I'm not just talking about a reaction. I'm talking about a negative reaction. And we'll be discussing that to a certain extent. And so I want to put myths into an understandable context for people, as well as thinking it through, certain aspects of it through for myself. Okay. And by the way, I love this, this particular, um, which is um, uh, Indra with his many eyes indicating that he sees all. Uh, and I think that's a really wonderful metaphor, just putting the eyes on the figure to say, this guy sees everything, you know, just in case you don't know. By the way, Bishop Montaigne, you know, one of the figures in the front of our, our fondo, if you've never looked at him closely, he has eyes in his shoulders, indicating that he also sees things from other directions other than just, you know, uh, the front. Please go ahead. Now, I want to start by, I don't want to give the impression with this presentation that this is just my own take on myth. It's derived from many, many different people with a far more nuanced understanding than my own, which is relatively superficial compared to some of the ones I'll mention. I'd, I'd like to mention them at the front. Often we'll, we'll have something at the end and I'll say, okay, here's the sources that I use for this presentation. But in this case, I actually want to talk about where some of the ideas came from. The first, of course, is Joseph Campbell, a professor of literature who worked in comparative mythology and comparative religion. And um, his work, you know, I don't know how many books he wrote. Um, and if you want a really fascinating view, you can get a copy of The Power of Myth that he did with Bill Moyers and George Lucas on Amazon Prime. Um, and by the way, when I said myths are also decades long, many people may not be aware that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg used Joseph Campbell as a reference when they created Star Wars and when they created some of their other science fiction works. Uh, and that was, in the case of Lucas and Spielberg, that was the intentional creation of contemporary myth. So when I say that myth is, can be decades long, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and so when we look, when you think about Star Wars and you see the various symbolism that's in there, that was a contemporary intention to create a mythology for contemporary times using memes that would be understandable to people today. Um, the second person I want to mention is Claude Levi Strauss, Strauss, a structuralist anthropologist, myth and meaning of required reading if you're an anthropologist, as well as Bronislav Melanowski and his work on myth. He did a great deal of, of work on myth. Jack Goody, another anthropologist and sociologist who did work on myth, myth ritual, and the oral. And, and a, a few names that you may, may not be as recognizable, those previous names may all be recognizable to people. But Ursula Le Guin, um, her writing was influenced by her anthropologist parents, Alfred and Theodora Kroger. And her books, such as The Left-Handed Darkness, were science fiction fantasy that she intended to be mythic uh, in their structure. 
And so if you read any of Ursula Gwynn's work, you'll see the broad strokes of myth that she includes within those, within those works. And of course, there's Emile Durkheim, a sociologist. Um, if you haven't heard of him, um, you should have. But reading him is can be a bit, yeah. And then, of course, Carl Jung, whose work on myth and consciousness are revelatory in the study. Two names that you probably have not heard are Chie Nakane and Amiko Unuki Tierney, uh, two women Japanese anthropologists um, whose ethnographies are unabashedly semi-mythologic. And when I say that, I say that they're writing, they're writing ethnologies, which follows a specific structure. However, when you read them, they almost read like myth because of the way that, that both of those authors wrote their material. Um, Chie uh, Nuki Tierney, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Emiko Nuki Tierney is someone whom I used in many of my courses uh, that I taught. And they taught about taught me personally a great deal about myth and the provisional reality and how they're interrelated. And I probably would not have been able to identify that had I, had I not gone through this process of creating this presentation on myth. And thinking back on it, I realized how, how instrumental those two people were. Um, however, having said all of that, one of the most instructive is, is Mercier, Eliad, who uncovered the deeper meanings of myth. He was a historian of religions and philosopher. He was a novelist. He was a professor <coughs> at the University of Chicago. And his work, Myth and Reality, is required reading for anyone interested in this topic. So if you're interested in myth, go for um, Eliad. And I have to say that he's not that difficult to read, uh, even though his writing was in the 30s and 40s and that. That period of anthropology can sometimes be dense, but he was a very good writer. Uh, the last person I'll mention is someone whom you have all been exposed to, Job Jindo, <laughs> whose dissertation in 2006 was Bi Biblical Metaphor Reconsidered, a Cognitive Approach to Poetic Metaphor in Biblical Prophecy. So you probably wouldn't realize that we have within the Sangha framework of uh, someone who's an authority on myth. I was hoping he would be here this evening. He's too busy trying to finish his books um, because he would probably say, uh, -san, I'm not sure that I would go quite so far in saying <laughs> or whatever. <clears throat> so, and this evening we're going to examine the nature of myth, perspectives of myth and reality, and an understanding of myth for Buddhists in the 21st century. Now, I have to tell you something. I was thinking often about Chip when I wrote, when I was doing this, right, because of, of his response to myths. Um, however, having said that, there's a long standing, um, what would I say, something that has been going on for a long time. Whenever I do something specifically thinking about so and so, whoever it might be, I might be thinking, oh, this tonight, Jane would be interested in this, and I, have Jane in my mind when I'm writing it. I had Chip in my mind when I, well, the, the thing is, the person whom I write for almost inevitably never shows up <laughs> at the meeting. That's, that's just a given, you know. So, uh, so we're gonna talk about the nature of myth, perspectives on myth and reality, and an understanding of, of myth for Buddhists in the 21st century, which is what Chip would say, well, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> so please go ahead. And we'll just begin by pointing out the nature of myth. Well, what, what is myth in a, in a sort of general context? Um, myths are allegorical narratives that are a part of every culture. They explain the how and meaning behind why things happen as they do. The how and the why and the meaning of things. Uh, and according to myths, this was the time when the sacred first uh, appear established in the world's structures. And many people will have heard me mention uh, previously on numerous occasions the notion of the axis 
um, that existed in the around um, from around uh, 600 BCE to around five well a thousand years from around 600 BCE to about 600 uh, CE, which was the the axis of the sacred. So virtually all of the world's religions were formed in that period of time, um, and myths describe the primordial events that are that made society and the natural world as they are. And so we find in many of the world's religions and the responses to cultures, the myths will often be revolving around how did the world come about, how did the world populate, who, and we'll discuss more uh, in just a moment. Iliad notes that in traditional societies, myths represent absolute truth about primordial time. So in traditional societies, myths are seen as truth. And I have to say from my own experience, um, living in societies, you find in different societies, uh, you'll find a difference between people who are living in the postmodern or post-industrial world and people who are living in more traditional worlds. And people who are living in a post-industrial, post-modern world tend to have their heads filled with critical ideas about things like myths, and we'll discuss why in just a moment. However, people who are living in more traditional world don't have that perspective. They look at um, myth not as necessarily history, and we'll discuss why in a moment, not as history, but they accept myth as something which is relevant to their culture. And I think that that's very different than what we see in most Americans today. So, um, and we could go on to the next slide, please. You know, I just, I just came back from Southern Mexico, and none of this is myth. It is reality. <laughs> you, you mean what they believe in yes. Southern Mexico? Exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. They, you know, this is in the city, though. This is not. No, no, I, I, I no, I realize, and and tr and I would I would suggest, based upon what you just said, that people living in agricultural settings are more likely to accept myth as a reality than people. I'd I say the people in the city that are not agricultural in Mexico, oh, at least, just like us. No, they're just like the oh, farmers. Just, they, just like the farmers. Okay. In the Bible, right? Early, yep. First been around for five thousand years. Yeah. And the Mayan myths, but yeah, I haven't. I didn't get a chance to talk to any of those. <laughs> right, I'm talking yeah. about just the Catholics, just the Catholics, right? right. So myths are, and, and thank, thank you, Craig. Yeah. Myths are classified. Just trying to, try to sit in for myth for Chip. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. So, so just so people know, Craig is channeling Chip this evening. We're on time. So, myths are classified in several ways. The first is cosmology, how space is imagined. In Buddhist cosmology, we have Mount Semeru, which sits at the center of the universe and explains various realms. And, and, and the people, up until the time that the Tibetans um, fled, took exile from Tibet, the many of the Tibetan masters, into India, they would actually point to that mountain over there as Mount Semeru. It was a, as real to them as for us to look and, and count the point to Mount Washington or something along those lines. Um, so that's an example of cosmology in a Buddhist context. That Mount Semeru was considered the center of the universe and all the realms fit within that, that uh, uh, schematic. In Chinese myths, the body of the great old giant called Pangu transforms into the mountains and the seas and the winds. How a natural feature then becomes uh, a living creature. Mm -hmm. Myths speak of various beings that populated the universe. Islamic mythology talks about the existence of jinns, angels, and humans. And it's really interesting. I was having a discussion with a, a Muslim friend of mine one day who, who comes from um, Malaysia. and he was, we were talking about something, and I said, oh, so you must have been um, accustomed to dealing with jinn. And he said, 
Yeah, that's what happened to my brother. My brother was attacked by a jinn, and he was never the same afterwards. And here's a, and by the way, the guy's a medical doctor. So you can't say that he was a, a primitive person who had this belief in someone who felt so strongly, though he was scientifically trained. Um, Islamic mythology has that idea. The Mahayana Buddhists speak about multiple Buddhas occupying multiple Buddha realms who can be summoned by chanting and prayer. That's an example within, within Buddhism of, of how we see uh, the myths speak of the various beings. <coughs> myths establish heroic figures who do extraordinary things. The Greek mythology, one hears the adventures of Hercules and Theosis who killed monsters and saved damsels and earned admiration of the Olympian gods. Um, and by the way, don't, don't, you know, Pudo Mio and uh, Bishamonten are, are pretty, you know, kick-ass dudes themselves. So just be careful not to uh, uh, be pejorative toward them. Um, mythology throws light on ideological narratives and offers explanations. For example, the story of Eve's temptation into the Garden of Eden explains why women have a subservient position in human society. As a result of that very that very tale, that's we can identify that as one of the places where it began. Is Eve's? Let's face it, you know, she had this thing going on with Satan that we don't we don't even go on go into right now. But as a result of that, we can see what happened. Yeah. Uh, original sin, namely, myths may serve as a cultural history alluding to actual events and practices from the past, such as migrations earlier forms of social organization and natural occurrences like meteor showers, eclipses, or floods. In other words, when we read about Noah and the Great Flood, what most archaeologists and, and biblical scholars would suggest that there was an actual flood that gave rise to that story. In other words, it didn't come out of nowhere. It was a response to something that people had, had actually experienced. A sacred history myths may serve as justification for a particular institution in society, and they link the present social order with a sacred past and conditioned behavior toward desired ends. Oshin, could you turn the stove? Thank you. A special place in uncovering the deeper meaning of myths belongs to Eliad, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention his name several times during this presentation. He recognized that myth is a complex cultural reality that could be considered and interpreted from various viewpoints. However, he defined myth as a narration of sacred history of how reality came into being. In other words, we juxtapose the real with myths. Myths are responsible for bringing reality into existence. Just think of it in those, in those terms. The reality might be the whole of the cosmos or just a part, an island, a species, or an institution. He points out that myth also expresses and codifies beliefs and guiding rules for society. It describes the deeds of supernatural beings and becomes the model for human behavior. It reveals ex exemplary models for all human rights and significant human activities, diet, marriage, work, education, art, wisdom. In the words of Bronislaw Malinowski, myth, quote, safeguards and enforces morality. It vouches for the efficiency of ritual and contains practical rules for the guidance of humans. Myth is thus a vital ingredient for human civilization, end quote. The first myth, first myth supported by artifactual evidence dates back to about 4000 BCE in Egypt. The tales of Gil Gilgamesh were written around 2150 BCE to about 1400 BCE. Mahabharata is circa 825 BCE, and I could go on and on and on, but that gives you an idea of some of the periods of time that we're talking about. However, those are written materials that I just mentioned, or epigraphs. In the case of, of Egyptian uh, myths, they're the hieroglyphics that we see on the walls uh, in, the, in the tombs. The, the pyramids. Uh, however, archaeologists tell us that the Eurasians who are growing across the Central Asian steppes were among the first to create myths, and something like the Mahabharata, 
which is in the Indian myth, which is the basis for uh, Hindu society, probably came out of those those people who were migrating across the the uh, steppes, Central Asian steppes, and that was thousands of years before the Egyptians. So some archaeologists say that we we should go back at least ten thousand years to see the creation of the first myths. Of course, we have no record of them because they weren't they weren't written out. So there's nothing that we can refer to. Myth criticism um, is a system of anthropological interpretation of culture created by uh, Gilbert Duran. Scholars have used myth, mythic criticism to explain the mythical roots of contemporary fiction. An example, this is, the con this is my own example, because I couldn't find one that everybody would understand. So from my perspective, one of the contemporary myths in Western society, meaning the Southwest of the United States, and actually all of the West of the United States, with the exception of California, which is its own myth, um, is the myth of the self-sustaining individualist that is derived from the myths about cowboys and early Western settlers. So this is a, that's a myth, that, that notion of the self-sustained individualist is a myth, like, okay, so, who raised that cowboy? <laughs> you know, he didn't just pop up and as an adult went out and conquered the West. You know, what, how, who led the wagon trains for the settlers? You know, but we have this myth of self-sustaining individualism um, that, that really has had a, 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 a certain, no one I think would here would argue, has had a dramatic effect on American society. And that's a myth that goes back several hundred years, not a myth that goes back several thousands of years. <clears throat> Next, please. So what is the perspective of myth, history, and reality? The subject mythology emerged in the 19th century. Think about this. The subject of mythology emerged in the 19th century as the world discovered the subject of history. We think of those things as being so way back. I mean, Ashoka, there were epigrams on the stelae from Ashoka. Well, isn't that history? No, that isn't history. That was an epigraph and it didn't have a narrative per se. Before that, memories, legends, myths, parables, folklore, and, and, and history were all bundled together in one basket. So no one would have thought, if I'm thinking about, um, let's say, a J the Japanese myth of Amaterasu, um, in which Amaterasu is the, is the sun goddess who brought life to the world after being locked in a cave. No one would, in this room probably, I, I shouldn't say that because maybe somebody does, but typically no one in this room would think, oh, that's Amaterasu, that's a myth. Well, what if, if, if you didn't think it was mythologic? And what about the fact that that is the basis for the emperor of Japan becoming the emperor? That's what he does. He communes with Amaterasu as part of his coronation. That, in other words, history and myth in that case are really one and the same. It's an explanatory mechanism for the imperial family as well as other, as, as well as other things. Um, history demanded evidence and critical thinking. Greater value was placed on material artifact, epigraph, and archaeology, and less importance were given over to texts. Before this period, Noah's Ark, Moses, and the story of Jesus Christ were all seen as history, going back to what Craig is talking about. That's, that, that's what you were saying, is that correct? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, with the, with the rise of history based on quote-unquote science, these were challenged as there was no evidence to prove the existence of Noah's Ark, the exit of Moses, or the virgin birth of Jesus. They were all bundled in the 19th century under mythology. Previously, they would have been considered as a narrative that we would now refer to as history. Since the 19th century, it's been common to use the term myth to refer to something that's untrue. It reflects the secularization of our beliefs for myths in its original sense, a sacred tale or received truth. Other people's myths, by the way, may be fake, but not mine. 
<laughs> Those myths are fake. The myth about Noah's Ark is fake. It's fake. However, the idea of the self-sustained individual, that's real. <laughs> right? That's the distinction that I'm making here. And I'd like to use a metaphor that comes from the natural world to better understand the relationship between uh, myth, history, and reality. A human's, and, and please go to the, to the following. <clears throat> and this is a biocentric analogy, and it makes sense since I'm a biological anthropologist. Mm -hmm. um, humans see a specific visual spectrum of light. And this is a limitation on perceiving our environment, hence our understanding of the nature of the universe. Let me place this in a different perspective, using the analogy to understand the relationship between myth, history, and reality. History is seeing in black and white, like the visual spectrum of humans. Most humans have three types of cones. There's cones and rods in, our, in the eyes of most uh, critters. And humans have three, three types of cones, and they see the colors red, blue, uh, excuse me, red, yellow, and green. And I'm sorry, red, yellow, and blue. And so the, prim the primary colors. And these represent short wavelength, medium wavelength, and long wavelength. wavelength. And this is a limited view of the world. So history is that black and white view of the world. It sees the world in a very limited scope. And I'll, to, to show you how limited, I'll be explaining that in just a moment. Mythology is seeing in color, analogous to the mantis shrimp, who has between 12 and 16 photoreceptors, contrasted to three of humans. Why would a mantis shrimp have so many? Well, that's an evolutionary issue. And they can see both UV light as well as Polaroid, uh, polarized light. Um, two things that humans cannot see. We can't see polarized, we can't see UV light. A butterfly, that beautiful little creature that we see flitting around in the spring, has 15 types of photoreceptors. Most animals have more or fewer types of color receptors than humans. In other words, humans have a specific range of receptors. And so what your dog, for instance, cannot see blue at all. Or no, I'm sorry, it can't see red at all. It, it's the blue and yellow, but it can't see red. And so when you think about what would your what would your life be like if you didn't see the color blue? And and by the way, the blue spectrum is is limited in human beings. We don't see that much of the blue spectrum. We see a very minor part of it because that goes up into the infrared uh, zone of light. And so, um, as I was saying, so this, that mythology is an expanded view of the world like that of the mantis shrimp. Human C3, the mantis shrimp sees something like, like 16 or photoreceptors. <coughs> Reality is seen being beyond our human capacity, the wavelengths that we can measure, not observe. Ultra ultraviolet infrared. This might be analogous to the Hubble telescope that sees between 90 to 2,500 nanometers ultraviolet and Webb telescope, which observes the Webb telescope sees infrared, which is 600 to 2,800, 500 nanometers. These are compared to the human who has a limited visible light of 380 to 750 nanometers. So, 380 to 750 nanometers, and yet a shrimp can see all the way into the thousands of nanometers. The Webb telescope, and that's a picture of the Webb telescope uh, from the Webb telescope on reality, um, is a much more expanded view of the universe. In other words, the biocentrism of humans means that we have a limited understanding of the universe around us based upon our corporeal existence. Um, if we had uh, another another animal which is which is really uh, interesting that has um, th well think about in, aside from from sight think about a dog's hearing they can hear in areas that we can't even come close to uh, when you think about 
it's, it's recently been determined that uh, some of the sea mammals can actually feel the vibrations of things that are literally 100 miles away. We can feel the vibrations of things that are meters away. But there are certain sea mammals that feel the vibrations of things hundreds of miles away. That's a difference in our ability to understand the world around us. In other words, people say to me, no, this is my experience. And I'll say, yeah, that's your experience. But how limited is that experience compared to the rest of the universe? And so just like the Webb telescope that we see the picture of there, and by the way, that picture that was taken from the Webb telescope has been mastered so that we can see it on our visual spectrum. Because we couldn't see that. That's been that's been rearranged, so they assign colors to certain elements of the infrared spectrum. That's how we can that's how we can see that. So according to Eliot, again, postmodern people display traces of mythologic behavior because they intend because of their intense need for sacred time and eternal and eternal return. Despite postmodern people's claim to be non-religious, they ultimately cannot find value in a linear progression of historical events. Even contemporary people feel the terror of history. Those are his words. Here too, there was, oh, this is also his words. Here too, there is, also, there is always the struggle against time, the hope to be freed from weight of dead time and time that crushes and kills. Time that crushes and kills is thinking about our own mortality. Thinking about our own mortality essentially crushes and kills our spirit in many cases. Next, please. So let's look at an understanding of myths for Buddhists in the 21st century. In studying religion, Iliad rejects certain reductionist approaches. Iliad thinks a religious phenomenon cannot be reduced to a product of culture and history, which is what we do when we often are looking at things. He insists that although religion involves the social person, the economic person, and so forth, nonetheless, all these condition factors together do not of themselves add up to the life of the spirit. That's Iliad's image and symbols. Myths are a critical part of cultural studies, for they explain how people imagine the world. And today we recognize secular myths, such as justice, equality, nation state, all are ideas meant to shape human society. None of those are natural laws. None of those can be measured in the natural world. What's, what's the wavelength of justice? We, we, in our imagination, we impose the notion of justice. We impose the notion of equality. We can say that's a natural, that's equality is natural. No, it's not. There's nothing in nature that speaks to equality. If that were the case, evolution would not be, would not work. Evolution requires something other than equality to work. So these are ideas that are meant to shape human society. And they're great ideas, justice, equality, the nation state. What is the nation state? Where do you find that in nature? You don't. There's no scientific explanation for any of those three items. Would we choose to dismiss justice, nation states, and equality because they're not part of the natural world? I would hope not. Jung suggests that mythical stories connected individuals and societies with collective unconsciousness in which humans partake and where one of humankind's ways of interacting with the vast unseen world. Myths and legends can show what was different about human life when these stories originated and what stayed the same. Joseph Campbell asserted that myth has an important function in society in four ways. It evokes a sense of awe, it supports a religious cosmology, it supports the social order, and it introduces individuals to the spiritual path of enlightenment. And by the way, Joseph Campbell was not a Buddhist. 
Many avoid the use of the word myth and prefer words like social constructs, imaginarium, and ideology. And that makes them seem less fictional and gives them their due, considering the power they yield in society. <clears throat> From a Buddhist perspective, the sutras are the word, words of Shakyamuni Buddha. And these words are often rendered into an imaginarium that conveyed the teachings in a way that pure description is ineffective. Such tales not only stimulated the imagination, but were an attempt to describe what words alone cannot. They also fit into a social cultural milieu in which the myths were the explanatory vehicle of the time. And one should not take myths at face value, and we should recognize that the symbolism embedded in the narrative is worth exploring and allow our sense a sense of awe and wonder. And we should also allow our heart, mind, spirit to embrace the story, recognizing that there is a reality about which we can only scratch the surface. As Joseph Campbell wrote, myth introduces individuals to the spiritual path of enlightenment.